Now, where does this come from? How, where, where, where did I find this corporate responsibility to respect human rights? I found it everywhere. You go on any corporate website, any major company in the world, and you will see we respect human rights. You look at any voluntary initiative like the Global Compact, companies that belong to it, all 8,000 or whatever it is now, they sign on to the principle that companies respect human rights. You go to the ILO Tripartite Declaration on Multinational Enterprises, Companies should respect human rights. You go to the OECD Declaration uh, on multinational, um, transnational enterprises. Companies respect. You, I've never seen a company say we don't respect human rights. You go on any. You show me a website where it says we don't respect human rights. It doesn't exist. So, wh what I did was very simple. I said, okay, I take you at your word. You respect human rights, but how do you know that you do? How do you know that you respect human rights? Do you have systems in place that would allow you to demonstrate to yourself, let alone to anybody else, that you respect human rights? Well, the answer, of course, in most cases was, no, we just respect rights. Well, but you don't know that you respect rights unless you have systems in place that demonstrate to yourself, let alone to anyone else, that you respect rights. And so what I've suggested, I've introduced the concept of human rights due diligence, that companies must exercise human rights due diligence to be able to say that they respect human rights. So in a certain sense, the responsibility to respect rights cannot be described as a legal duty under international law because companies generally are not subject directly to international law. But they are subject to fundamental laws of logic. And if they say they respect human rights, they must have systems in place to know and show that they respect human rights. So we have laid out um, the, 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 the fundamental elements of a human rights due diligence process. We've discussed it extensively with the business community, with corporate lawyers, both in-house counsel and external law firms, to make sure that um, what, what we are proposing, in fact, is doable uh, within companies, and it's eminently doable. And in fact, a, a significant number of companies are already beginning to realign their own internal um, risk management and uh, control and oversight systems uh, in keeping with some of these um, recommendations. The third pillar of the framework is access to effective remedy. In the best of all possible world, worlds, things still go wrong. And when they go wrong, those who have been wronged need access to remedy. Access to remedy can take several forms. One, of course, is judicial remedy. Uh, and we've addressed extensively uh, the obstacles to um, judicial remedy in many different jurisdictions um, and how that might be uh, improved. Um, we've also focused and done some, I think, quite original work, if I may say so, um, in areas of non-judicial um, remedy. Um, I come from the most litigious society on the face of the earth, the United States. Everybody sues everybody all the time. Uh, and it, it, the, the, the most, the most um, uh, rewarding profession uh, is, is to be a, 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 lawyer, a trial lawyer um, on contingency fees um, uh, and, and sue a large company. I mean, it's just, it, it, it's, it's heaven for, 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 for lawyers. Um, I made the mistake uh, of becoming a PhD instead of a lawyer. Uh, so I end up studying what they do <laughs> instead, of, if, instead of cashing in. Um, but even in the United States, the most litigious society on the face of the earth, in fact, the number of disputes between individuals and communities on the one hand and companies on the other, the number of disputes that ever end up in, in the legal system are minute. 
they're a tiny fraction. Uh, many, if not most, are dealt with through various alternative dispute resolution um, techniques, which are much less costly, work much more quickly, um, and um, mediate, in many cases, the relationship between a company and the community because they do have to live with each other in the future. And so, in many cases, for some things, obviously, this is un entirely inappropriate, but for others, it's not. So even in the most litigious society, alternative dispute resolution techniques, and in fact, we've reached a point in the US where courts will actually instruct parties to go out and try to get a dispute mediated. And then the court, if, if once the mediation takes place, the court will, will endorse the mediation. So we need also to look at non, this is the point I'm trying to make, at non-judicial uh, ways um, of, of resolving disputes um, at an early stage and, and preferably at a local stage where the dispute takes place before it then ends up um, in the international arena um, months or years later. The recent case, the Ken Saravivo case, um, uh, um, the, the, the case against Shell in Nigeria, it was in U.S. courts for 12 years. The, there was never a substantive discussion of the merits of the case. It was all procedure. After 12 years, they decided to settle for $15 million. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure that the plaintiffs felt that a, a good deed had been accomplished. Um, no one admitted any guilt. Um, there was no mediated solution. I'm not sure what changes on the ground as a result of this kind of an outcome. I haven't specifically looked into this. But we need, there, there is, there is a, a desire um, for, uh, on the part of many human rights um, 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 advocates. Uh, we, we, need, we, need, we need to get into the courts. Yes, we need to get into the courts and we need to improve judicial institutions, but we also need to build up alternative dispute resolution mechanisms. That's the point that I'm trying to drive home. And one of the things that we've done, we, we've, we, we have conducted a, a dozen or more very practical projects to try to test some of our ideas um, on the ground to see if they actually work. Uh, so that when we come back with um, our final um, um, guiding principles, we have some assurance uh, that, um, that, that they would actually deliver what they promised to deliver. One of the more interesting uh, projects that, uh, that we have been conducting is um, five different pilot projects on company level uh, grievance mechanisms where a community and a company set up jointly um, an oversight body, joint oversight body, um, set out the terms of reference for when the community has a dispute, how does it get lodged, uh, filed with a company, um, how is responsibility inside the company assigned in a particular case? What's the time frame for reaching uh, some sort of a resolution? If a longer period is required, there is a review with the community and so on and so forth. Now, the places where we are doing the, these, um, you know, they're, they're, not, um, they're not Denmark where you have very little friction over these sorts of issues. There is Sakhalin Island in the Russian Federation, Sakhalin Energy with its surrounding indigenous uh, community. Sarajon Coal in Colombia, also it's the largest Latin American coal mine also in the middle of indigenous community. Tesco, the British retail chain in its agricultural supply chain in the Western Cape. Uh, and um, Esquel Group, a Chinese apparel manufacturer that has factories in Vietnam, and the grievance mechanism pilot is in Vietnam. And HP, Hewlett Packard, uh, d has set up a p a pilot projects with two of its uh, suppliers in the electronics industry in China. So we have Russia, we have China, we have South Africa, um, we have um, Vietnam, and uh, we have Colombia. Um, it's a good representative sample um, of, of countries and sectors and challenges. My team members go around to visit the sites regularly to talk with local um, uh, community leaders um, and with company people to see how it's going and the reports so far um, have been uh, very um, constructive. Now at the end of the day, we need 
to nail these um, uh, ideas down firmly and then build on them. And that's what the next step in my mandate um, is all about. Um, I was invited um, last June by the Human Rights Council to draft guiding principles for the implementation of the Protect, Respect, and Remedy framework. And we're doing this as we have done everything else on the basis of extensive consultations. Uh, I'm on a marathon consultation trip uh, this week and next. Um, we spent um, last week um, in Paris with uh, international business uh, and business associations. Uh, we had an informal uh, meeting in Geneva with state representatives. Uh, and on, as I'm sure some of you know, on Monday and Tuesday, uh, we're back in Geneva with um, NGOs um, and, and community groups. Um, and, and the idea here is, having seen what the framework looks like and what our work has consisted of, to get the views of, of, of the various stakeholders on what they think the, the guiding principles for implementing this framework should look like. Um, and on the basis of that, we will draft the guiding principles, post them on the internet for public comment for two months, uh, and then finalize them and submit them to the Human Rights uh, Council. We, uh, when we finish on Tuesday with the NGO consultation, um, that will be our 45th international consultation uh, since 2005. So whatever else anybody can say about this process, they can't say it hasn't been inclusive. <laughs>